thank you so much, uh, Professor Jennings. Uh, it is a, a really an honor to be here, uh, to be the guest of uh, Lord R. Darcy and the uh, Institute for Global Health Innovation. Uh, Lord Darcy's work as a scientist, as a uh, clinician, surgeon, as a uh, prop uh, propagator of innovation in healthcare is widely appreciated uh, in the United States. Uh, and I can say that we at the uh, Commonwealth Fund also deeply appreciate the work of the Institute uh, of Global Health Innovation, which, uh, as Professor Jennings said, uh, has uh, been helping us with some work that we've been doing on the topic of frugal innovation, which is a very interesting topic that, if time permits, in Q&A we might discuss a little bit. Uh, the, uh, I, I also am pleased to be here in no small part because it is a refuge from the goings-on of our political system uh, in the United States. Not being exposed to the 24-hour news cycle about uh, the Trump-Clinton adventure uh, is, is such a, a relief. We looked at your Brexit experience and we asked ourselves, how can we do better? <laughs> and this is the production that we have come up with, and it truly is uh, a theater uh, as much as it is politics. Uh, it would be also impolitic of me not to recognize uh, my board member and former Harkness fellow, Simon Stevens. Uh, you should always recognize your bosses when they're in the audience. Uh, and uh, Simon is, uh, in addition to the many contributions he makes here uh, to the National uh, Health Service, he also is a terrific uh, a terrific complement and uh, participant in the Commonwealth Fund's activities, uh, ch helping us chart our course both in domestic health policy and also in international health policy. So a, a terrific addition. I'm going to talk today about a group of patients that we have called high need, high cost patients. That's not a term that is widely used. It's a term that we've coined at the Commonwealth Fund, and, but it is gaining traction as the issue gains traction. And I'm particularly going to talk about uh, why we need to worry about this patient population, uh, who they are, what some of the solutions are to caring for them better, uh, and what some of the obstacles are to caring for them better, and then what we at the Commonwealth Fund are doing in our own programs to try to improve the care of this population. So why should we worry about high need, high cost patients? Well, the first and most important reason is that they are very important in our lives. They are our family members, often our aging parents, uh, our aging siblings, uh, our in-laws. Uh, they are an important part of our lives uh, and still have a lot to contribute to, our, uh, to our, our, our countries and to our populations. There are other reasons, though, that have to do with policy to worry about this population. So this is data from the United States about the distribution of healthcare expenditures by a fraction of population. And as you can see here, the top 5% of the American pop population in terms of spending accounts for 50% of total healthcare spending. 5%, 50%. 1 percent accounts for, I think, about 35%, 22%. Very costly patients. I'll say more about these in just a moment. Now, I tried to find comparable data for England. Uh, and the best that we could come up with is this slide, which looks at the concentration of expenditures for, NHS, for an NHS trust in terms of the proportion of patients. And this is from a publication from the Nuffield Trust from a few years ago. And it shows a very similar, a very similar 
level of concentration. 3% accounting for 45% of expenditures at that particular trust. I suspect that this distribution is common across the industrialized world, which really highlights why this is an important population for all industrialized countries and increasingly for industrializing countries. Now, there's another reason to be worried about this, or at least concerned, and, and to be action-oriented with respect to this population. And that has to do uh, with demographics. Let me move to this next slide. I'll get back to talking about who these people are in more detail in a moment. But as you can see, we all know about trends in the aging of the population. In the United Kingdom, the proportion of over, over, six, over 65, uh, age, people over age 65 in your population is going to go from about 18% to 24% over the next 24 years, 25 years. In the United States, it's going to go from 15% to 22%. Looking at Europe, Germany has the most pronounced tendency toward aging, with its over 65 population going from 21% to 31%. The high need, high cost individual tends to be 65 or older. They're no, by no means all older, but they are more likely to be older, which is why the aging phenomenon is so important for thinking about the demographics of this group. But they have other characteristics. They tend to have multiple chronic conditions. They tend to have a functional disability. And this is a very important attribute of this population, which I will say more about in a moment. They tend to have behavioral health problems. They tend to have socioeconomic hardships and material hardships. And they are more likely to be near end of life, though we have a mistaken stereotype in the United States, at least, that they are mostly near the end of life, and that is not true. Many of them are destined to live decades with their multiple chronic conditions and their disabilities. Functional limitations. This is something that we have recently at the Commonwealth Fund discovered in research we've been doing on our over 65 population that are eligible for Medicare in the United States. The average American, adult American, spends about $4,800 a year on health care, a very large amount by international standards. If you have three chronic conditions, you're likely to spend 50% more. That's this group here. If you have three chronic conditions and a functional limitation, which is a deficit in your ability to perform typical activities of daily living, inability to clothe yourself, inability to feed yourself, or if you have a problem managing your life, inability to pay your bills, inability to talk on the telephone, you spend 400%, more than 400% more annually on health care than the average adult American. And as I said, these are not all elderly. Some of them are in what we call in the United States disabled, often because of one of these functional limitations. To put it very simply, a successful health system, a high-performing health system, in the, in the words that we like to use in the Commonwealth Fund, must care adequately, more than adequately, must perform well for this population if it is to be successful in reaching its goals. This is the highest priority population for any health system 
that is concerned about the costs of care. It also should be a priority for any health system that is concerned about quality and safety. Because by virtue of the frequency of contact that these individuals have with the healthcare system, they are far more likely to fall prey to its failings, to have quality problems, to manifest safety problems, to be over-medicated, to have side effects from over-medication, uh, and also to uh, have tests that go awry, and also, by the way, tests that are unnecessary. Now, let me take a little conceptual detour before I go into talking about some of the things that we have been learning about how to take care of these patients and talk about a very simple model about how to think about improving health system performance. So this model is actually an adaptation of a model that was in the appendix to a very important report that was done about 15 years ago in the United States called Crossing the Quality Chasm, uh, which really set a framework for US health system improvement uh, for uh, much of the future. You can see the performance of our healthcare system as the product of the interaction and direct effects of microsystems and macrosystems. As I said, interacting with one another and directly affecting health system performance. Now, you're, of course, asking yourself, what do I mean by microsystems and macrosystems? Microsystems are where clinicians and patients live. They are where, in the American colloquialism, the rubber hits the road. They're what systems analysts call the sharp end, the point of service delivery. They're things like a primary care GP's office, an intensive care unit, an operating room, an admitting department, any of those places where people are experiencing interactions with other humans or care processes that actually affect their health care. Now, most clinicians, when they think about changing the health care system, think about changes at the microsystem level. For the surgeon, it's how do you train, improve the rate of turnover in the OR so I can do more cases. For the cardiologist, it's how do you do the same in the cath lab. It, for the admitting physician, it's how do you get the admitting department to get people through the admitting department faster so that there isn't a backup in the emergency department. Those are what clinicians feel as the obstacles to improvement. But there's a whole other layer of influence which systems analysts feel is much more influential on the overall level performance of the health system. And that's performance at the macro system level. Oh, did I already go there? There we are. So that's, those are microsystems. These are macro systems. Macro systems are things like government programs and regulations. In the US, there are things like what our government pays for and what are the qualifications that enable you to get paid. In the US, we have lots of things called health plans. They are, in their uh, penumbra of influence, a macro system. Individual hospitals or systems of hospitals can be that. Accrediting bodies the bodies that license clinicians, who set, that set the standards for what clinicians need to know and be competent at, those are macro systems. These are things that have pervasive influence on all micro systems in, in a system, in a healthcare system. Now, I was going to make the point that we actually have accumulated through health services research and experience <coughs> a lot of information about what works at the microsystem level if we're interested in improvement. My favorite example is something called reminder systems. 
So that's this one here. I wrote a paper probably 25 years ago that reviewed the literature on reminder systems. These, are, these aren't complicated systems. They're things like a sticky on the desk of the clinician reminding the clinician to give a flu shot or to check the feet of a diabetic. Simple reminder systems improve compliance with guidelines <clears throat> by dramatic amounts. And this has been demonstrated repeatedly. Another thing that works extremely well are computerized decision support. This one right here. We know through cl good clinical trials that if a clinician is supported by decision support through an electronic health record, they give higher quality care. Good randomized control trials have shown that. I will talk a little bit about a pay, the PACE program, which is specifically designed to deal with high-need, high-cost patients. But I think you get the point. We know a lot, but the question is, does it get used? And the answer is, it often gets lost in translation. It just does not make it from the literature, from the halls of academia, like Imperial College, it does not make it to frontline care. That is a perplexing and enduring frustration for academicians and policymakers. I have sat around many tables with researchers and many tables with managers where the question has been, how do we disseminate? How do we move something from the laboratory to the bedside? It's hard with a pill or a new device. It's doubly hard with a new system, which requires behavioral change on a large scale. So one possible hypothesis that I want to share with you, and this may seem self-evident to some of you, but it's helpful to me when I think about it. One of the reasons that we don't disseminate microsystems is that we have failed to create macro systems that support and sustain innovations that work at the microsystem level. This is particularly true in the United States for multiple reasons. I'll go into some of them with respect to the high need, high cost patient and their innovations. Uh, but I suspect traces of this uh, fact can be also found uh, in the UK and in other health systems. The fundamental point here is that you cannot expect clinicians to be heroes or altruists on a day-to-day -day basis, fight systems that stand in their way to make improvement, and expect a better outcome. You have to make it easy to do the right thing. You have to make it the easiest thing to do. And I'm by no means minimizing the difficulty of do that, doing that. Uh, we've been struggling in the, in the United States to find a way to do that for, for decades. We haven't called it this, but that's what we've been trying to do. We're making some progress. But that, I think, is the fundamental challenge that health systems uh, in the Western world face. So having put that in perspective, what works for high need, high cost patients? What do we know about what works at the microsystem level? And I'll get to some of the obstacles that the macrosystem throws in its way in a moment. Well, research that we've done at the Commonwealth Fund is still incipient. Uh, research we funded, we haven't actually done it, has begun to reveal some commonalities among systems that work well for this population. They have interventions that are targeted to particular groups or segments of this population. This is not a uniform group of individuals. It's extremely heterogeneous clinically. Segmenting it to make sure that when you, when you embark on a microsystem change, you are adapting the intervention to the, to the group of patients 
that you're treating is critical to success. And we have, by the way, begun doing some work on segmentation uh, in the United States uh, that, uh, and are looking actively at other systems of segmentation that, uh, that may be working. Close coordination of team members. Now, we speak of coordination all the time. It is a kind of holy grail of care for this population and all other populations. The interventions that work don't have fragmented coordination. They have very close coordination that includes face-to-face -face interaction between team members. Not just an occasional email message, not a fax, but meetings where people talk about individual patients and problems. The level of communication that occurs human to human is still unduplicated by electronic systems, and it seems to matter in the teamwork that's required to coordinate care for this population. Strong health IT that enables both risk prediction understanding who's likely to become high cost before they become high cost, but also that enables continuing surveillance. The reminder systems that I mentioned, but at a much higher level of sophistication. And patient and, uh, and caretaker engagement. These patients are not hospitalized. They're often not institutionalized. They are at home. They are taking care of themselves or being taken care of by family members or other caregivers, their being drawn into being part of the team is absolutely critical to the success of these interventions. Now, what are some examples? There is a, uh, the, I mentioned before the PACE program. PACE program, the PACE program was pioneered at this site in San Francisco. It was initially put together to care for aging Asian, popula Asian Americans in the San Francisco population by a local group. Uh, it has now spread considerably. It is called the Program of All-Inclusive Care for the Elderly. That's, that's the uh, uh, acronym PACE. Started in 1971. It's now spread to uh, well over 100 sites with 38,000 or more enrollees. Unfortunately, getting to 40,000 in the United States doesn't get you very far. That is hardly uh, a decimal point on our health care, uh, on, on the size of this population. Uh, but uh, it has shown some resilience in terms of spreading, not nearly what we might want or expect. It's structured around a daycare program for the uh, high need, high cost patient, especially the elderly. There's team-based care, multi multiple disciplines involved in the care of those individuals who are enrolled in these settings. There's flexibility about the uh, uh, availability and ability to spend on non-medical issues like nutrition and travel and housing. Those three, by the way, it seems from the literature, those three types of non-medical services are among the most influential in helping to manage high need, high cost patients. The result has been reductions in hospitalization, nursing home use, uh, emergency room use, and mortality in this population, which is why it has spread at all. On the other coast, in my uh, home city of Boston, another activity, the Commonwealth Care Alliance, formed uh, about 15, 13 years ago to take care of frail elderly and other disabled. So it's not just an elderly population, as that individual on the previous slide showed. This is not an elderly person. He's disabled. Emphasis on team care and coordination of care. Emphasis on the use of non-clinical personal help, personal health aides, community health workers, very important part of this model. Individualized care plans that take into account behavioral health needs, what we call in the US capitated payment, which means a single payment provided 
to the Commonwealth Care Alliance each year for the total care of a patient. One of the things that the Commonwealth Care Alliance has done with this freedom and flexibility around spending is they bought an apartment building because they were spending thousands of dollars a night for uh, behavioral health hospitalizations for their population. And they decided that having their own apartment building with indwelling behavioral health expertise would save them thousands of dollars per hospitalization. An example of how non-traditional thinking can be very important to managing this population. So what about the United States? What are we doing? How well are we doing? Well, obviously, not well enough. Uh, we are um, facing some difficult issues. Our incentive systems do not work. You all may have heard, those of you who are into the weeds on the US healthcare system, may have heard about some of the changes that have occurred recently since the Affordable Care Act was passed in 2010, and there have been changes, but they are still marginal. Most of our clinicians are still paid on what we call a fee-for-service basis, which means that if they succeed in reducing the use of services, their incomes go down. That does not make it easy to do the right thing. That means it is an uphill struggle. That means the chief financial officer will come looking for you if you are doing the right thing and tell you to stop doing the right thing. So we need to work on that. That is a macro system par excellence that doesn't work in the United States. One of the things that is positive in this respect is that the current administration, which will be gone in a few months, has committed by 2018 to changing our payment incentives to prioritize what we call value-based payment in fee-for-service, which means linking fee-for-service payment to a quality and cost outcome, or more aggressively, hoping that by 2018, 50% of Medicare pay payments will be devoted to what we are calling, they are calling alternative payment mechanisms. And those are things like prepaid group practice, accountable care organizations that take risk for both quality and cost, that turn around the incentives. Culture. I suspect this is a universal Western issue. Maybe with our individual, individualistic ethos in the United States, it's even more of a problem. We do not train clinicians to work together. We don't train physicians to work with nurses and social workers and community health workers. We don't train, I venture to say, nurses to work with those other individuals either. This is a major challenge when you try actually to install a new model of care and expect clinicians to suddenly know how to use a community health worker. They don't. They have to learn it. And they have to give up something of their autonomy and control in order to do it. A big obstacle to propagating some of these models. The United States it distinguishes itself in many ways. Uh, this uh, chart comes from the work of Elizabeth Bradley at Yale University. It's become widely circulated in the United States. I don't know how widely circulated it has been here in England. But it documents something that is non-intuitive but very important. So the United States, which we know, is exorbitant in its expenditures on health care, is about average in annual GDP allocation to the combination of social services and health care. So when you put in housing, nutrition programs, uh, health education programs, the things that uh, that matter in addition to health care, uh, we come out about the same as most Western countries. You all here at the UK are about the same as the US, a little bit below average. France is way up there, 
21 plus 12 percent. What's interesting about the United States is how disproportionately we spend on health care. So we've made a trade-off. We are willing to pour money into medical care, but we are not willing to pay for housing, nutrition, and other so travel to and from uh, sites of care, non-medical support. We are not willing to pay for those. It's not in our culture. As I mentioned before, those are very, very important determinants of health status. Uh, I'll come back to that in a moment. Uh, but it is another macro system problem, political and social uh, in its origins, uh, that we have to grapple with in the United States. What's the Commonwealth Fund doing? Uh, we've identified this as an issue for very, very specific reason. In addition to its importance, we think the time is ripe for our country to make a much smarter and larger investment in the care of these types of individuals. And that is because of the trend toward adopting risk. I worked at Partners Health System in Boston before I went to the Commonwealth Fund. Uh, I was able to watch how our, the senior management in that organization, which is the parent institution for the Mass General, Brigham Women's Hospital, and uh, three or four other hospitals and, and uh, rehab facilities and a whole bunch of other, the largest system in, in New England. They became a pioneer accountable care organization. They accepted risk, financial risk, for their Medicare population. All of a sudden, they got very interested in high need, high cost patients. It doesn't take a wizard to figure out that if you're going to be accountable for costs, you have to manage the patients who cost the most. A very traditional, slow to change institution pivoted within months to prioritize this work. And I can go through what that meant, but it, had, it meant reorganization, it meant reallocation of resources, uh, it meant uh, uh, organizational changes that would never have happened if the incentives had not shifted. So that's why we're interested. We have an international working group on this. We are intent on learning what you and the French and the uh, New Zealanders and Australians and the Canadians are doing with this population to see whether there's th there are things we can learn. This international working group, we hope, will report to OECD health ministers uh, with, uh, in January on what they found. One of the interesting, not complete models, but a very kind of uh, a tantalizing model is here, comes from the UK, from Jersey Island, was discovered and written up as a case study by one of our former Harkness Fellows. It involves the use of postal workers who are courtesy of email and Twitter and a whole bunch of other innovations, less employed than they used to be, using them on their daily visits to check in on patients who are disabled and, uh, and need constant care with permission, with permission from the patients. So, uh, so far, this has been relatively successful. Early signs are, are that the patients appreciate it and the postal workers find it energizing as a new mission. They fill prescriptions and pick them up. They give reminders of appointments. They're not giving care. They're just giving support. Another interesting thing that was just featured in the New York Times, I don't know how widely known this is, but I thought I would uh, let you know that uh, our, one of our prominent newspapers is talking about innovations in this area. Something called the Silver Line, which uh, reaches out to or is available to lonely elders who don't have family, don't have caretakers, uh, have questions, have needs, uh, simply need support and human contact. Loneliness is a very, very strong predictor of depression. Depression is a very strong predictor of the exacerbation of all kinds of chronic illnesses. 
We have also teamed up with four other foundations in the United States. They're listed here. The Scan Foundation, the Robert Johnson Foundation, the John Hartford uh, Foundation, the Peterson Center on Health, to form a consortium working on the needs of high-need, high-cost patients. And we uh, talked about that in a New England Journal of Medicine, excuse me, perspective. It was published a few weeks ago. Uh, the first, the agenda for this is still new. We've only formally, and by formally I'm stretching the word formal a little bit, uh, we've only come together uh, officially, semi-officially for about a month. But the first thing we've agreed to do is to produce a playbook for serving high-need, high-cost patients. We're predicting that accountable care organizations, other risk-bearing organizations are going to be rediscovering this population. They're going to be asking themselves, what do we do now? They're going to need some place to turn. And we want to be able to provide them the best information that's available about this population. So some of the things that will be in the playbook. Something about the value proposition. In the United States, we have a competitive healthcare market. We have to prove that things have, that do OK at the bottom line. So why, why, go, why deal with this population is the first question that we want to secure. And related to that, we're going to include a return on investment calculator that will let the, C the chief financial officer get quickly to the answer about whether a particular intervention is going to work for his or her patient population. We're going to talk about a segmentation framework. We're going to talk about patient profiles, case studies of proven models, places to call to find out more about those models, um, and policy and payment reform opportunities. Now, most of this work is about microsystem change, and I've been telling you that macrosystems are a big problem. Part of what we're anticipating is changes in incentives. Somewhat depends on the results of the next election. Uh, but the direction, directionally, we're heading in the right uh, way right now, um, and maybe it will continue. But there are other things that um, we need to worry about at the macro system level. We're working with policymakers to think about how some of our payment systems can be uh, enabled to pay for non-traditional healthcare services, particularly our Medicare program, which right now does not pay for housing, does not pay for transportation, does not pay for nutrition services. If there is a way to let that happen within the funding of the Medicare program, we think that would be an enormous uh, have enormous value, and there's a group called the Bipartisan Policy Center in Washington, which is, as you could guess, bipartisan, uh, and is helping us uh, think about that. This slide speaks to the opportunity for cross-national learning. I've already given you a couple of examples of things that we are intrigued by that are happening here in the UK. We hope that there will be things that you will find intriguing among the examples that develop at the microsystem level in the United States. And I'd be delighted to take questions and answers. Uh, take questions. If you can provide the answers, that'd be even better um, about anything related to this. Or I suspect we may wander off into other topics as well. Thank you for your attention. <laughs>